I'm Jan Bauman from DeKalb County, and I have the privilege of introducing our next guest. Mike Nielsen is Director, Government Fec Fixed Asset Services, Inc., Chicago, Illinois. He has served state and local governments for over 30 years. His areas of activity include current, currently include capital asset policy and procedure reviews, capital asset implementation assistance, and the annual updating of capital asset information for financial reporting purposes. Mike is a past advisor of the GFOA Standing Committee on Accounting, Auditing, and Financial Reporting, and worked on numerous recommended practices related to capital assets. He serves as an instructor for the GFOA and has conducted the Capital Asset Accounting Seminar for over 25 years. He provided input for the following task forces. Gatsby Statement Number 34, Capital Assets. Gatsby Statement Number 42, Asset Impairment. And Gatsby Statement Number 51, Intangible Assets. Mike received a BA degree from DePaul University of Chicago and an advanced degree from Loyola University of Chicago. And I just want to add that um, I've been working with Mike for 12 or 13 years now, and there's something a little bit more that I, I want to, to give as far as his credentials go, in addition to his credentials, that Mike takes the reporting that, to me, when I first started doing reporting, well, I tried to do reporting about 20 years ago, and our reports were sparse, and some hadn't been done since the 70s, and we had a threshold of $100, so we were trying to report on everything. And he took this stuff that I had, and he gave me some clarity. And he takes this thing that's confusing and cumbersome, and sometimes you want to cringe when you think about fixed assets, and he turns it into an easy to manage process that complies with all the official rules. So you get a great package <clears throat> when you're working with Mike. And on top of that, he is a lovely person and a joy to work with. Please welcome Mike Nielsen. And while Jan introduced me as being from Chicago, born and raised, about five years ago, my wife and I moved to the dunes, Long Beach, Indiana, right at the Michigan border, Lake Michigan or whatever. And uh, we miss Chicago, but we love the dunes. So um, let me just begin with a couple of things. It's great to see many old friends and clients here. I've worked uh, with about 24 counties in Indiana over the last uh, 20 years or so. And I really mean this. Your job as auditor is not easy. And in fact, over the years, I've watched it, and I go back beyond the 20 years, but I've watched the job of auditor become demanding and really a lot more sophisticated than ever. You really have a tough job. I, I think of the auditor as kind of the, the point person within a county and the first person that you know, helps folks out and, and whatnot. Secondly, or, or thirdly, the accounting for and financial reporting for capital assets, and let's not forget, it's the largest number in your financial reports. Um, this is generally an issue and a challenge for all governments. I, I, I know that because I've spoken many, many times at the annual GFOA conference. And a couple of years ago in Denver, I was kind of complaining because they had me on, uh, on Sunday at 1 o'clock. And the year before in Minneapolis, I was at like 3.30 in the afternoon. And these are not you know, real good times or whatever. And each time, there were 
probably 500 people in the room, which says to me that it's a problem, it's an issue, it's a concern of governments. Okay, my position in all of this, in, in, in helping counties and cities and towns and whatnot, is that of a facilitator. And it was, this notion of a facilitator was best explained about 14 years ago when I worked with uh, Monroe County. And the auditor then was Barbara Clark. And she introduced me to the commissioners and many of the department uh, heads. And we were getting started because of GASB 34. And she simply said, Mike's here to help us with GASB 34, specifically capital assets. And he's driving the bus. So I just thought that was kind of cute. Today's presentation is meant to simply help you avoid the struggles and problems with fixed assets, because if you just charge into this, you're gonna have problems. And I want to, in the second half of my presentation, lay out strategies and decisions that can help you economically and successfully account for capital assets. And we can't forget, it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. You're never done. You might, you do an initial implementation and set up a record, but then all of a sudden the year is over and you've got to update this thing with additions and retirements and adjustments and whatnot. So you're, you're really never done. Okay, here we are in Florence, Indiana. And this is me. And notice uh, my email is there. If, if anybody ever has a question or issue, just send me a, a note or, or give me a call. Anyway, in terms of introducing and, and uh, a bit of the history, um, we're talking again about accounting and reporting of capital assets only for financial reporting. We're not talking about insurance or any other issue. We're talking about just for financial reporting. It is the largest number in your financials. It all began with gap compliance 30 some years ago. GASB 34 happened in about 1999, and it's primarily about capital assets and depreciation. And if anybody is having a problem sleeping, I suggest that you curl up with a copy of GASB 34. It's 413 pages long, and uh, it will knock you out. Um, again, governments have struggled, but these challenges are avoidable quote of an auditor, and this is Jan, our fixed assets were a mess, we had a $100 threshold, little guidance, um, we set up a new policy first, and I'm gonna talk about that as we go along today. Uh, this is where you can make life easy, and in terms of policy, everything from capitalization threshold to lifing to all sorts of issues, don't ever forget, these are your decisions, these are management decisions, there is no right answer. Okay, we put a plan of action in place. It made this monstrous task manageable and attainable. Again, everybody in this room is busier than they've ever been. When it comes to fixed assets or capital assets, you gotta do something to make it easy. You gotta do something to take the onerous time, you know, the time constraints that you have. You, you have to make some decisions up front so that you can do it. If it becomes a part-time job or even a full-time job, it will never happen. You just don't have the time. Uh, when GASB 34 happened again in 1999, I thought, oh, well, JCO you know, governments will be bringing new staff on to, I have yet to ever experience one instance where new staff was brought on <clears throat> to handle GASB 34 or to handle capital assets. It just kind of fell to the existing staff to uh, uh, implement and do. Okay, what does not work is the first part, first half of this presentation. What is, you know, what's the cause of this age old problem? Uh, oftentimes past implementations, that is the initial go round of getting the information they're not systematic, they're not well planned, people just charge out and do this, and sometimes can make 
problems that will last the, the, the length of the, uh, the time the inventory has integrity. And you, know, you literally are creating problems. Oftentimes the annual updating is not efficient, it's not timely, it's not comprehensive. In other words, if, geez, we've got a 2017 capital asset report, the auditors are coming in the front door, time to update it, don't even bother. It's already too late uh, to gather the additions and the retirements. Okay, first problem, oftentimes there's a dated capital asset policy. And trust me, I've seen some real buttes out there where the document is 20 years old and uh, it makes no sense, it's way too long, it's like the Magna Carta for Pete's sakes. Um, the existing policy, uh, first bullet here, is too long, too complicated. The auditor doesn't even understand it, which means the departments will never understand it. It's not clear, it's difficult to understand. The policy may have been borrowed from another government with no review at all, meaning we just change the name at the top of the first page, and this is our policy. No, 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 again, take the time when you write a policy or set up a policy to make the decisions that are yours to make, management decisions. You know, what's an asset, what isn't an asset, um, how do we update this, who's going to do this, and, and, and on, uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but um, make those decisions. Um, the document needs to have definitions. Again, what is a fixed asset, what isn't a fixed asset, and it needs examples. Okay, we spent $300,000 on resurfacing some county roads. Is it capital? I don't think so. We've spent a fortune repairing the roads, but it's not a capital asset. And there, again, more coming. A capitalization threshold, and I'll talk a couple of times about this. There is a recommended practice that the government finance officers put together years ago, and it says plainly that your capitalization threshold should be no less than $5,000 meaning for something to be an asset that you're going to report and account for, it needs to be on a unit basis at $5,000 or more. So the laptops and all kinds of tools and snowblowers and uh, chainsaws and whatnot, they're not assets. They're not capital assets. They're, they're way, way, way too low in terms of the cost for them to be considered. The operative word here in the GFOA recommended practice is no less than You've got some folks here in Indiana uh, that have used uh, 10,000 or 20,000 as a capitalization threshold. It really abbreviates the report. You keep the money, but it abbreviates the report because you're getting rid of a lot of the little stuff. Um, over on the Illinois side, there are uh, mid-sized cities that have used $50,000. One guy uh, was the village of Lombard, west of Chicago. They uh, $50,000 threshold. And I asked, well, what about police squad cars? Well, we only keep them for a couple of years, so what's the difference if we expense them in one year or depreciate them over two? Again, it was their management decision and perfectly appropriate. Okay, there's a dated property record. That's another, uh, if you will, what does not work. Um, perhaps we should take a look, and this is another recommended practice, every five years, at the property record, the actual detail, to see if it has integrity. And um, again, it might, it might not, but uh, every five years is a good benchmark in terms of taking a look to make sure that the uh, data is accurate. The data base, meaning your, your uh, property record, may contain unreported retirements, and I'll change that to say it does contain unreported retirements. You know, stuff that's gone out the, the, the door at the department level or stuff that's been uh, retired or disposed or scrapped or whatever, but still in the report. The problem there is that it, it gums up the works and can make things onerously complicated. Also, if you don't retire some big stuff that, that is, is gone, you will have overstated balances, which is actually worse than understated balances because you've got the record that includes this asset, but it's no longer there. You want to take the time every couple of years to get unreported re retirements out of your report. There may be 
previously unrecorded assets, things that you've purchased that nobody thought to add as an addition. Also, a, a dated property record is in need of editing and you know, a possible need to reclassify assets. This is something that's, that's pretty common. Insufficient departmental involvement is another big problem why this doesn't work. All departments have fixed assets. I think they're all on the hook for being responsible for those fixed assets. Um, assets are um, central and necessary to provide service. Um, but in their defense, the policy is not concise or clear. Again, if you've got a policy that's 40 pages long, it's way too long. It, it's way too verbose and it's way too confusing. The policy is also not communicated to or understood by the departments. Many have never seen the policy. Um, what's important is that the departments be involved because they're working with the assets, they're buying assets, they're retiring assets, they should be part of this whole process. And often this whole accounting for capital assets doesn't work because they're not involved. Too much attention centrally to smaller assets. I've seen governments that have kept their capitalization threshold artificially low, a hundred or five hundred or a thousand dollars because they have the feeling that uh, it'll be a, a good property record and we'll do the control and we'll do the accounting all in one spot. But the problem is the record is way too big. It's 80 pages or 800 pages and it, it, there's just too much there. And it costs as much time and effort and money to control a $100 asset as a $100,000 asset. Okay, oftentimes the department does not get to set parameters and inclusions. And what I'm suggesting here is that the control of minor but sensitive assets be shifted to the departments. Let them control the items that are under the threshold. You know, within a police department, perhaps weapons and two-way radios and whatnot, and with IT, let them control the laptops and the, you know, the um, uh, iPads and all of the electronic gear. Let them do that. They're doing it anyway, so just formalize it. Um, we've got a, a, a mix of control and accounting issues, and that's what's gumming up the works here in terms of this not working. Um, responsibility has never been delegated to the departments. No one's ever talked to them about um, controlling minor but sensitive. Now, I, I know I need to get a life, but <clears throat> it was a number of years ago, I was talking to my older, my oldest brother at a graduation party. My oldest brother, he's retired now, but he was Oak Brook's fire chief. We're at this party talking about fixed assets. So I, again, I need to get a life. Um, anyway, he was saying that um, on the minor stuff, on the trucks, you know, the axes and the sledgehammers and the fire extinguishers and the, the medical gear and testing, whatever, each truck was inventoried once a month. They were already doing it. They were already controlling minor but sensitive assets at the department level. So to have a, you know, a low threshold because you're going to pick up that stuff, it doesn't work anyway. And again, it's a matter of formalizing what is already happening. Uh, a couple, uh, three, four years ago, I worked with the Indiana Convention Center, which, by the way, was absolutely gorgeous in um, Indianapolis. They went to a $20,000 threshold. So anything below 20000 was either control of minor but sensitive or was expensed as uh, you know, minor assets. And we went around and talked to five different departments. The one that I always remember is, is the IT department. They controlled all the laptops, everything computer related, printers and on and on and on. Their list of everything throughout the whole organization was probably 200 pages, single space. They did a really good job. They were already doing this. It was just a matter of formalizing it and, and getting them involved in every year, updating it with additions and retirements. So the trick is, and I'm, I'm going, going backwards and forwards here, raise your threshold as high as you can you know, justify it, but then on the minor but sensitive assets, and you've got plenty of that, let your departments get involved, let them decide what they're going to control, and have them do it. 
get out from under so that you can focus on where the money is. And it's not in laptops or furniture. Okay, your property record should be as concise and manageable as possible. Oftentimes, people have problems because there's no maximization of efforts or top-down approach. They've never attempted a high-level analysis of where's the money and where are the percentages. I got a, a slide coming up, it's number 23 and 24, that shows once you go through your major accounts, once you go through your general infrastructure, roads and bridges, your buildings, and your fleet of vehicles, you're probably 97% of the way to accounting for the $100 million in fixed assets that you have. So I say, and Gasby says the same thing, if all the money's in those three classifications, let's focus there. Let's not get all hung up on laptops that are 1200 bucks or even 600 bucks, or iPads or printers that are $89. No, we don't, let's not worry about that stuff. And the, the problem is people worry about that stuff and they miss the big picture and all of a sudden they've got no fixed asset record and they have no idea about the $100 million or whatever the number is and they're in trouble. Okay, so we want to do an abbreviated analysis of where's the money and where are the percentages. And again, Gasby's very clear about where is the money. Okay, unreported retirements are a problem everywhere. And that's why every five years or so you should take a look and kind of weed out any unreported retirements. But don't forget every year you want to report retirements. And you don't want to miss any. The problem with things that are in the record but are long gone physically is that you risk overstated balances. I've run into cases where people have buildings that have been torn down. They're still in the report. They're still on the insurance report. People are buying insurance on a building that hasn't existed in 12 years. Okay, um, the problem with unreported retirements, if it really gets out of hand, is that it can reflect on management and it can reflect on the integrity of the record. You know, if you've got a record that goes back 20 years to the implementation and no one's ever taken a look at unreported retirements and there's all kinds of problems and the thing has no integrity, that can reflect on management and that can be a serious problem and it can lead to a lot of confusion. Okay, again, there's no minor or no control of minor but sensitive items at the department level. This is a problem. And as stated, um, it, it does work at the department level. You gotta talk to folks, get them involved. And that's why I find that <clears throat> with many, if not all of the GASB 34 implementations that I was involved in, I worked with the departments across the board. They were part of the initial implementation. There was a buy-in. They felt an ownership there. They had a handle on or knew what the notion of additions and retirements and balances and depreciation. And it worked to get them involved up front because every year you're coming back to these folks for retirements and additions. Okay, there is another recommended practice on the control of minor but sensitive assets. And again, I was involved with the GFOA for years as an advisor on their um, uh, standing committee on accounting, auditing, and financial reporting. And usually we would meet for years and it would result in um, recommended practices. And they're kind of high level. They're a page, maybe two, but they're very good. Their most popular one is the one on capitalization threshold because people have used that to take to their board or, or to their uh, trustees to raise their threshold. You know, as we know, there's nothing authoritative on capitalization threshold, so folks would use the GFOA recommended practice. I say this now because they have a website, obviously, GFOA, and the, all the recommended practices are on there, and you can print them and, and uh, have them uh, at the ready. Okay, and again, uh, the last bullet here, on the control of minor but sensitive, you should do it because it's already happening. Oftentimes, it's very easy just to formalize um, the process. 
Okay, oftentimes a problem is that there are no definitions or examples of expense, of improvement, of repair, of maintenance. You know, people don't know what we're talking about. So how about an example? Well, you know, if you resurface a road, it might be $300,000 to do the resurfacing, but it's not a new road. It's not a capital asset. We're going to expense it the year it happened. Um, so, you know, we want to... We want to put in examples into our policy of what repair and maintenance is, uh, what an improvement is, what a capital asset is. Okay, oftentimes the policy is a very vague document which is going to cause problems on a daily basis. Oftentimes it, it's just boilerplate with no real clarity. Oftentimes, again, there's no definitions, there's no, no examples, and when we talk about additions or retirements or whatever, folks at the department level don't know what we're talking about. So we want to be clear. And again, I, let me be clear about a policy. I think a policy should be a document that's maybe four, five pages tops. But when you get down to these examples, they should be concrete, just a couple of sentences of exactly what you're talking about. But a capital asset policy does not need, need to be 25 or 30 or 40 pages. Four or five pages is plenty. And if at four or five pages you've got a you've got a shot that somebody will read it. Okay, there's non-existing, and this is oftentimes a problem, there's non-existing information on construction in progress. And there's just no reporting. You know, there folks are spending millions of dollars on, on some new bridges or they're adding on to City Hall, or they've got major construction going on, and they just sort of wait until the end and then maybe, maybe capitalize the asset. Um, I say no. Set up a construction in progress account. It's simply a bucket that you throw the money into as you're building something. At the end, you dump the money out of the bucket and count it, and you capitalize the asset. By setting up construction in progress, it's a good discipline that you won't miss an, a new asset and that you'll capture all the dollars. And it starts from day one. When the project is approved by the powers that be, that's when construction in progress starts. And we don't want to forget the engineering and environmental and all the soft costs, which can be, you know, on a, on a road or a bridge, it can be 20 or 30 percent of the cost. We don't want to miss that because it, it's part of a depreciable asset. Okay, there's no, again, this is the last problem, there's no schedule or timeline for reporting capital assets at year end. We wait until the end of the year, we kind of scramble around for additions and retirements, and the auditors are coming in the door, as I said, and it's too late. And we end up putting something together real quickly, it's not perfect, but you know, once the auditors are happy, we're done. And again, that just keeps the problem going. And that's why so, so many folks, there's 86,000 governments in this country, and everybody's got a problem with fixed assets, and this is part of the reason why. Okay, what does not work then? In conclusion, um, it's an issue with most governments. Again, the conferences that I, I spoke at in, in 14 and 16 and 17, again, this is a national conference at GFOA. One was Denver, one was Minneapolis, and one was Toronto. There's always, again, four or 500 people in the room because they've got a problem. You know, we just, our records are a mess and we don't know where to begin and we don't have time and, you know, What's a fixed asset and what isn't? I mean, all these questions have never been answered. The challenges are needless. The planning up front with a policy and perhaps procedures and what are we going to do and who's going to do it, very, very important and uh, uh, for the success of this. And we want to commit the administration and finance to this and... Uh, you know, make it a priority. Okay, now for some good news. What works? We want to start with a high-level analysis and planning. Where's the money? Where are the percentages? What deserves our focus? What doesn't deserve our focus? 
Let's start with a policy. This is a roadmap. We're going to account for capital assets. So how about a policy that talks about what is a capital asset, what isn't a capital asset, what's a repair versus what is an improvement, and let's start there. In terms of procedures, procedures are really synonymous with the updating annually of our capital asset information. And to me, procedures translate to who, what, where, when, how, and why. In other words, we've got to update this database every year. Who's going to do it? Who's responsible? What information do we need? Where is it going to come from? When do we do this? How do we do it? And why, why are we doing this? Procedures, which are coming up in some of the later slides, seek to answer those questions. And they should be answered because if, if they're not answered, you won't do it. I think we should strive wholeheartedly for simplicity because primarily people are so busy. So you want to keep it nice and simple so that you have a shot at getting it done. We also want to be honest about our capabilities to implement the information and update it annually. That's why I say you start with what is an appropriate threshold. Is it $5,000 on a unit basis? And I say on a unit basis because we don't want to go capitalizing groups of furniture or groups of, of uh, laptops or small electronic gear because then if you start capitalizing groups, you don't have a threshold. Everything is capitalized. And so we want to we wanna be honest about our capabilities to, to, to do this. And I say simply the higher the threshold, the better because all of a sudden the equipment list, which was 90% of the report, boils down to perhaps two or three pages. Very doable by department. Okay, Yogi Berra to the rescue. Don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. And I like this from years ago because I saw years ago that a lot of folks, you know, big uh, plans to capitalize everything and not miss a, not miss a beat and, and pick up everything w across the government and uh, in essence they let the perfect get in the way of the good. You can literally create a monster if you overdo it with your policy and uh, again artificially keep your threshold low and try to you know report on everything. No. The first choice is we're doing this for accounting and financial reporting only. So let's keep what we're doing to a minimum with the auspices or the, with the condition that we're going to capture most of the money, again it's in the big stuff, and the greater percentage of the money, if you will. Okay, we want to start with a new capital asset policy. Keep it simple, keep it short, keep it understandable. Um, the, again, the recommended practice um, on capitalization threshold is available, as is the threshold on the control of minor but sensitive assets. Um, I think if you could start there and incorporate those two documents, or only a page each, into a new policy, you'll be very surprised at uh, how workable the new policy will be and how accepted it will be across the government. We want a high-level analysis of the existing record. We want uh, to make sure the data is organized. We want consistency of asset classifications, meaning land improvements uh, versus buildings. A parking lot is not infrastructure. It's a, land in, it's a land improvement on the infrastructure, your classifications. Of course, you want to separate roads from bridges. You don't want to forget to separate the right-of-way, which is land. It's a, a, a separate non-depreciable asset, and, and then so down the line. We want to do an analysis, as stated, of the dollars and the percentages. Uh, we want to make, take the, the existing data that we're going to use and perhaps edit it, make it consistent. We want to roll it up where possible. We want to break it out where possible. Uh, we want to check classifications and possible reclassification. Some folks will take their buildings 
not as one class, but they'll componentize their buildings and separate the roof from the shell, from the systems, meaning plumbing and electric and, and whatnot, um, just because they're, they're going to depreciate those um, components differently. The roof might get 20 years, the shell might get uh, uh, 80 years, and the systems might get uh, 15 years or so. I say don't overdo it with componentization, but it, it, it can be, can, can provide a much clearer picture of um, the depreciation expense that you're, you're um, experiencing on buildings, particularly true with a school corporation. You know, Chicago Public Schools I worked with years ago, they have 600 buildings. It behooved them to know um, what kind of shape or how old the 600 roofs were. So there's a, a whole bunch of things here, but you want to do at least an analysis up front and again, strive to keep it as simple as possible. You want to communicate with the departments, the auditor's office or the finance department or the clerk treasurer, if it's a city or town, can't do it all. It is time to start sharing the wealth, at least with the control of minor but sensitive, but also with the annual updating. We need to get from the departments the additions and retirements. We need to get their input. And again, if they're involved with the initial implementation, you've got a shot at this. But if it's strictly a memo that goes out on Monday and says, we need your additions and your retirements, you probably won't get any answer. OK, the department that uses and maintains an asset has the responsibility to assist in any related import, uh, reporting. You know, they're on the hook as well on this. But again, you can't, you can't do it all centrally and you can't do it all from either the auditor's office or the, the finance office. We want to be clear as to expectations and timing, especially, I got a slide coming up, especially on the annual updating. It's not an open-ended thing. We need this and we need it in, in a couple of weeks and so be it. Okay, an analysis of the allocation of balances by, uh, as I mentioned before, the dollar amount, the percentage. Um, it takes minutes to do this. And here's a good example of an actual mid-size county. They've got a $109 million capital asset balance at historic cost or estimated historic cost. I just find this fascinating in that we are accounting for assets on a basis of historical cost. If you were to put a replacement cost to this 109 million, meaning let's start all over and rebuild everything, it would be double or triple that amount. That's why this is such a serious issue. There's a lot of money involved. And secondly, let's take a look here. It's $109 million in capital assets. The land is under a million, primarily because the land is so old. Even the right-of-way goes back to you know, the 1890s or so. The infrastructure and the related right-of-way, which is a small part of this, is $85 million. So that's 80% right there. The buildings are 14 million, almost 15. Improvements, other a couple of small parking lots, $107,000 it cost. The equipment and vehicles, in this, in this case, it's a $5,000 threshold. The equipment and vehicles here are $6.5 million. Most of the $6.5 million, at least two-thirds, if not 70% or more, are the vehicles. You know, especially your highway department, those dump trucks are $200,000 with a city. I, I had one last week. On an update, fire truck, $850,000 for a fire truck. And I've seen them higher than that, you know, million one. So the vehicles are, are a big part of this, and the software is a million, and software is a capital asset, even if you're leasing it, and it is depreciable. So where's the money here? It's in the infrastructure, it's in the buildings, it's in the vehicles. Take out the two million that the equipment represents. So that's where your money's at. That's what we want to really focus on in terms of accounting and financial reporting. 
on a percentage. Land isn't even 1%. Infrastructure is pushing 80%. The buildings are almost 14%. Improvements are other, one-tenth of 1%. Equipment and vehicles, 6%. Again, the vehicles are, are probably two-thirds or 70% or of that. And the software, of course, is, is negligible. That's where the focus should be on accounting for fixed assets, capital assets, for financial reporting purposes. When it comes to the control of minor but sensitive, all the stuff that's under the threshold that you've shifted off to the departments for them to control it, it, it within the department, and again, they're doing it already, it's part of their uh, perceived job, then it's not an accounting issue, meaning they're, they're controlling minor but sensitive. But it's not accounting, so they don't need cost. They don't need to, to depreciate anything. They just need a list. That's all it takes to control minor but sensitive. It's just a list of perhaps the item, perhaps the serial number. That's optional. It can pretty much be whatever you want it to be. Uh, oftentimes, um, an IT department will tag their minor but sensitive assets. Fine, maybe they work in the tag number. But again, you're not constricted by any kind of accounting or financial reporting for minor but sensitive. I always suggest it when, when folks are going to lofty capitalization thresholds, just because it helps justify the higher threshold and it will make the auditors feel more comfortable that you know, you're, you're exercising control over the entire government and over all of the assets. Okay, we want to establish control. Again, it's a recommended practice. Um, that you can access. We want to deal with unreported retirements once and for all. Um, we all know Charlie Pride. I used to always stop in to see Charlie um, over the years, and one time we were telling each other war stories, and he says, you know, when somebody says there were no retirements, I don't know what to do. <laughs> And I, I was telling him some stories where, you know, years ago I had been at a community college and, you know, it's a million square feet of community college. There's stuff everywhere. And for somebody to say, we didn't get rid of anything, nothing was stolen, nothing went out the back door, come on, who's kidding who? They just didn't do it. They just they didn't get a handle on those retirements. And... What um, a good-sized county in the north part of the state does, they, I worked with them on their GASB 34 implementation, and they have a $10,000 threshold, and um, they would, uh oh, their system is Excel. It's nothing fancy. Depreciation is not rocket science. They do a page break by department at the time of updating. They then go into the claims and pull all the capital additions, vehicles, large equipment, trucks, et cetera. They then update the department worksheet, you know, the sheriff and highway and whatever, and put in the additions. Then they send out each department, his or her worksheet, with a memo on top, and I helped construct the first memo Here's your department's capital assets, everything over 10,000. By the way, we've already updated it. We have put in the additions. Would you just check mark or cross off or highlight any retirements? They send them out on Monday. It's due back on Friday. And I'm proud to say they've been doing this for probably 12 years, and it works. They've made the department's job a lot easier. If you just send a memo out saying, oh, by the way, uh, we, need all your re we need all your retirements. Can you get that information back to us in a couple of weeks? You won't get anything. They won't know what you're talking about. They won't, they won't have any sort of point of reference. But if you can kind of meet them halfway, meet the departments halfway, you got a shot at this. Okay, so we want to do the ad centrally. We want to update. We want to send it out, and it'll work. We want definitions and examples of capital versus expense versus improvement and want to work those right into our policy. This is what works. Um, 
on capital, increased capacity or efficiency. In other words, we add on to the county administration building. We added on 10,000 square feet. It was $4 million. That's an increase in capacity. That's capital. That's a capital asset. If we extend the useful life beyond its original expectation, fine. Let, that's capital. We need to put in examples of that. If something is an improvement, in other words, we dig up two miles of a county road, we go down to dirt, we start all over, it's two, two and a half million dollars a mile, that's an improvement. That's a, cap, that's a new asset. It's not a resurfaced, older road that looks new but really isn't. Okay, what's not a capital asset? We need to spell this out. This is what works. If there's no increase in capacity or efficiency, that's not capital. Folks need to know that. We want to um, spell out repairs and maintenance. That's not capital. It's not a capital asset. It's going to be written off the year of, uh, of, the, of the expense. We want specific examples. And we want examples of the minor but sensitive assets below the threshold so that everybody's on the same page here and we all know what, what is expected. What's not capital? Again, some common examples relative to buildings. Painting. You know, we, could, we can spend $300,000 painting the interior of a courthouse. Fine. It's a lot of money, but it's not capital. We haven't improved anything. So that's a good example. A roof resurfacing. It's expensive, but it's not, it's not a new roof. Well, it's, it's a repaired roof. It's not a new building, though. We've basically done what we should do in terms of maintenance and preservation. If we replace the furnace, it's expensive, but it's not necessarily capital. Uh, Recarpeting is expensive, but again, it's not capital. And um, we upgrade an electrical system, very expensive repair, very expensive upgrade. Same with landscaping. Uh, over to highway, we restripe or we, re we replace a culvert, we replace some signage, uh, some guardrail gets knocked down on a Friday night. Uh, the biggie is resurfacing an existing road, and this is where the highway department gets all worked up, you know, because it's so expensive. No, it's not a new road. It looks black and shiny, and it, it's pretty smooth, but it's not a new road. It's a lot cheaper to resurface than it is to build new. So it should be expensed. There were a couple of cases years ago where folks actually, two that I know of, one was the city of Chicago, they componentized their streets, meaning they capitalized the base and curb and gutter, but put an 80 or 100 year life on it, and it's probably longer than that, and then they set the surface up as a separate asset. And that might have been, pick a number, maybe $400,000 a mile. So when they resurfaced, they actually capitalized it and wrote it off over a, maybe a 15 or 20 year life. Perfectly appropriate. The point of that comment was that you can do a lot of different things, but be consistent and think it through before you do it because you might not have time uh, to componentize or, or do some of the, uh, the different things. Okay, what is a capital asset? Generally, it's a new asset that meets criteria for capitalization. Again, we're increasing capacity by adding square footage or adding lanes, widening a street. We're increasing um, efficiency. Um, in other words, we're providing service, but for less and, and much more uh, efficiently. Or we're extending a life. Um, I did some work uh, actually two years ago for the Washington Metro Transit Authority in Washington, D.C., and they were talking about taking a subway car. And by the way, they're $2 million a piece now. And they were going to do a gut rehab of, you know, take the shell and just replace all the electronics and all the interior. And that's not an expense. I mean, I would retire the old you know, take the shell and then add the million dollars or so that uh, it took to um, do this, quote, gut rehab. Okay, uh, we want specific written examples. 
Repairs and maintenance usually restore the asset to its original service potential, as opposed to the extension of a life where we're going beyond the original uh, expectation. Um, there's, a, there's a difference there. All right, on annual additions, when we're looking for the annual additions from the departments, or if we're getting it centrally, it's just the assets that are above the 5000 or 10000 or $20,000 threshold. That's a big part of the annual updating. You've got to kind of ferret through all the claims. And you know, a, a lot of folks will they'll, they'll key on the $10,000 number, but all of a sudden it's painting for $18,000. You have to kind of uh, push that aside because it's not capital. But that's the beginning is assets above this threshold, and they're going to meet um, the criteria for being a new asset or being an improvement. And um, it's important for departments to understand the difference between capital versus repair. Early on with GASB 34, uh, a lot of the highway folks, and I, I worked with INDOT about 12, 13 years ago. They were the same way. They just couldn't understand why resurfacing wasn't capital. You know, it was so expensive and it was so involved. And then you know, we had to go through and explain it's, it's not new, it's not an asset where one didn't exist and it's not, we're not going down to dirt and starting over. And yes, it's you know, 60 or $70,000 a mile, but a new road would be you know, $600,000 a mile. Okay, and on the annual additions, you wanna be careful not to capitalize groups of assets. You know, just because you spend three hundred thousand dollars for student furniture in a an elementary school doesn't mean it's capital. And when you start capitalizing groups, it will get out of hand after a couple of years. And you know what happens when you retire two of the items in the group? You know, how do you just how do you handle that? So it's on a unit basis. On policy, um, we want to do procedures properly and talk about the who, what, where, when, how, and why and spell all this out. The significance of CIP is, is, is there. It, it's, a, it's a good exercise and um, you don't want to miss the future capitalization and you want to make sure that you pick up all the dollars. And some of these projects, they're whoppers. I mean, it's a lot of money. Okay, on the update, usually it's three or four months. So here with a 12-31-18 fiscal year end, it's now that you should be gathering information as to additions, going through the claims. And we want to separate, you know, maybe mid-month or whatever, capital from expense. We want to update the report by department on perhaps November 1st, 15th. We want to send it to the departments for the retirements business. Then we want to update the quote list. And then finally, by the end of this calendar year, we want to uh, prepare the financial report and have uh, capital assets ready to go. And then, of course, we've got the whole gateway thing. And, and um, again, if you wait till January 1st to start this process, don't even bother. It's already too late. We want to commit to annual updating. Everybody needs to know what's going on. And we want to get the departments involved. The additions are generally best centrally because you, you've got the claim and purchase order information. You're writing the check. That's a good spot to capture your additions. The retirements, you have to rely on the departments. Control of minor but sensitive, if you're going to do that, get it to the departments. It's their job. If they don't do it, it's not going to happen, so let them do it. Okay, conclusion, new policy, new procedures. Take the time. doesn't take that long. Set it up so that it works. Analyze your existing property record and be honest. How good is this? A lot of little stuff. Let's streamline this. Get the departments involved. Focus on where the money's at. That's the that's that's even hard. But if you if you don't do that, you'll never it'll never work. Again, get the control of minor but sensitive to the departments. 
Take the time to get rid of the unreported retirements. They're gumming up the works. Create your definitions and examples. Do uh, construction in progress. Adhere to an annual schedule as if it were a religion. And um, again, commit to the annual update. If you remember anything that I said today, again, streamline this whole process. You're way too busy for this to take on a life of its own, way too busy. And most of you have, as counties, seven, eight, nine hundred miles of road, a couple of hundred bridges. I think of a bridge, they start at a million and go from there. And then you've got all the right of way, which can be three, four thousand acres of land in your jurisdiction. Then you've got all your buildings, you've got your, your vehicles, you know, 100 vehicles, and you've got then the equipment. The problem in the past has been folks, they focus on the equipment. When it's, it's all in the infrastructure, it's all in the buildings, and that, that deserves your attention. So streamline the process. Establish a good, clear policy that people understand. Monitor the property record. Take a look at it every once in a while, not just once a year. Commit to the annual update, and, and you can do this. It is very doable. Just think it through up front. Two miscellaneous things. We've got just a couple of minutes here. Recommended practices, they're on the GFOA website. Print them. They're not authoritative, but the, you can just present them to the, the board if you want to go to a higher threshold. Secondly, I worked with Purdue years ago, back in oh four or so, Indiana does not have an active state GFOA organization. So Purdue, through Indiana LTAP, took the lead on GASB 34, and we did a whole series, I was the instructor, uh, all day workshops on capital, um, on, on GASB 34, capital assets and general infrastructure. It worked out really well. When we got all done, Purdue approached me and said, you know, people still need help. We need to write a GASB 34 assistance manual. And I said, well, fine, I'm, I'm your guy. So I spent the whole summer going back and forth from Purdue, and we put together a GASB 34 assistance manual. And Touched my pocket thinking that was my phone, but it's not. <laughs> I left it in the hotel room. I know better. <laughs> anyway, um, with it, <clears throat> I wrote the GASB 34 narrative. We used my old worksheets for the Purdue manual, and we uh, created them as a really fabulous tool. Again, depreciation is not rocket science. They're just Excel. They become the tool for annual updating. Really great. They've been used all over the United States because a lot of times I'll do something like this in I don't know, Arizona, and I'll mention the Purdue worksheets and the manual. There's a line at the lectern after, oh, can we get those? And it's always so much fun to say, yeah, give me your email. I'll be happy to send you the worksheets. Oh, how much are they, Mike? Well, they're free because they were done with by me and with Purdue, so they're free. And people practically fall over. You know, nothing's free. And um, we did th the manual and the worksheets for the general infrastructure. And to do the same for your general fixed assets is not a big deal. In 04, and then we updated the document in 2012. And um, They I'm sorry about the small print, but they look like this. And they're a fabulous tool for accounting and reporting and depreciating your general infrastructure. And you can't read it because it's too small, and I apologize. I just couldn't cut it up because it would be too many slides. The right-of-way is on the far right. So it's, it's pretty much all your general infrastructure, all your bridges, all your right-of-way, all your streetlights and traffic signals. And again, the same thing can be done for 
buildings and vehicles and whatnot, and very no cost. And then this becomes the tool for updating your record. You know, I, I don't know what, I can't read the date myself, but if it said 2017 per worksheet, you just change that number and that cell drives all the depreciation and it updates all the depreciation. People love this and it's so easy uh, to use and, and um, I've said keep it simple and take a least cost approach and that's what Purdue wanted, that's what I wanted, that's what GFOA wants. GSB 34 was not meant to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to implement and comply with. So we were on the same page 15 years ago with them. And here's a, another depreciation example. And then um, questions and comments, and then that's me, and that's it. Okay, we are right on time, but I would like to end with, with just a story, if that's okay. And it's kind of like, two parts here, I'll be real quick. Um, half of it is true and the other half is a joke. Let me see a show of hands. How many of us, a lot of us are of the same vintage, how many of us have had a senior moment lately? How many of us have, I mean, come on, be honest. All right, this is, this is the true part. My wife Donna um, is a nurse practitioner and she recently retired from Rush University in Chicago. And Donna did Alzheimer's research, federally funded Alzheimer's research for 17 years, and physically examined thousands of senior citizens. Very expert in Alzheimer's and in memory care and all that. And now here comes the joke part of it. This started with me a while back. My memory was really slipping, I just, it's out of nowhere. My, it was just really slipping. So we were sitting in the kitchen and I said, you know, Dan, I said, ah, ah, my memory is just a, it's a wreck. I can't remember from one day to the next. She goes, really? Tell me more. I says, well, you know, I go to the supermarket. I've been there a million times and I get lost on the way. I finally go into the store and I forget why I'm there. I get to the checkout after I've picked up a couple of items. I forgot my wallet at home. I finally, I get home and I walk into the kitchen and you're sitting here and I'll, I had forgotten your name. And my wife says, man, how long has this been going on, Mike? And I said, how long has what been going on? 